Hi, David here, One Up Gaming. It's going to be episode 375 of the One Up Gaming podcast. So hopefully this might look a little bit better. I'm not standing two tables on top of each other to get the camera to the right kind of height. I've now bought a full um, standing tripod thing which goes up to like two meters. So hopefully that is the right kind of height to have the camera down. So I don't need all that. So if I do kind of look down, that's because I'm looking at the old table with the list of the games that we've played and that kind of stuff. Um, but Timu doing it again. I've got my stand, I've got my microphone, I've um, got my little gaming cupboard kind of sorted now. New keyboard, new sound form around the walls. Got an LED uh, pixel display, which looks amazing. I love it. You, it's like a little tiny screen that's like broken up into little tiny big chunky pixels and you put a picture on and it just looks pixelated. It looks amazing. I love it. So I don't know whether I'm putting that in the game cupboard on the back of the wall or if it's just going to be on my just my normal displays of my normal sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it should be fun. I have more team of stuff coming within the next couple of days, so I might have another video soon. Um, but we have one video up probably by the time this goes up, which will be cool. You can see at a keyboard, the stand, the pixel display, a three in one splitter for a um, HDMI cable. Um, I think that was it for this ta that kind of video thing, that team unboxing. So, yeah, go to our website, oneupgaming.co.uk. You can see we've got reviews, features, previews all on there. Go to our YouTube channel, just search One Up Gaming, and we have daily features, daily sort of videos. We normally have every Monday a UF, UFK? U, <laughs> we have a UK Top 40 gaming um, list. Every Tuesday, we normally have a Boostroid video. Every Wednesday, we have a Which is Best. Every Thursday, we have a retro inspired video. Every Friday, we have the podcast. Every Saturday, we have the games played this week. And every Sunday, we have the roundup of the weekly gaming news. Well, I guess entertainment news. We have some movie stuff in there as well. So that's what we normally do on the YouTube channel. You can buy these sort of like t shirts and jumpers. Just go to either Etsy, so go to the Etsy store and go to One Up Gaming, all one word where you can get over 220, 240 items for sale on there. So have a look on there, see what you think. Um, other than that, we're sponsored, as always, by Games Inspired Music. You can stream it, you can buy it, and 20% of each sale will go to the Child's Play charity, which is always nice for them. So other than that, um, please buy or, yeah, I guess buy Joe Dowling's book, the Outrunners, um, if you know the guy, just send him an email, say that we're advertising him, we're sponsoring him, we're sponsoring, we're advertising him on the show, and we're talking about his book. Bear in mind, my little tiny Kindle is in my bag, I still haven't found it yet, really. I know it's on the Kindle store, so you can buy it, you can watch it, read it on there, which is pretty cool. And you can buy our first 100 podcasts available at audiobooksontake.com. And on there, just search One Up Gaming where you can actually buy our first 100 podcasts. And one pound of each sale will go to the Diabetes UK charity. So I guess with that, we'll go straight on with the rest of the show. So straight into the games we've been playing this week after this short, quick break. Hello, Andy. This is Colin. I won't be able to get in the night. No, no, no. I'm sweating all big. I'm sweating Still David, still one up gaming, and we're still at the show for gaming at one up gaming episode three hundred and seventy five. I had a head moment there where I completely forgot what I was doing. Anyway, this is the part of the show where we go for the games played this week. So the first two I'm just gonna say great games. The first one is FC24, still playing the career mode, still playing as myself, still trying to get my stats up, and I love that. It's like the RPG kind of stat building, stat grinding that I love. 
and I think I'm up to a 72 now, I think I was, the last time I was on here, I think I was a 69 or a 70. Um, so playing right back. I've discovered that in the game, you seem to get more points if you do more assists and score goals. So you forget about the defensive duties and just get in there, play more as a winger and play more as passing into the centre and getting shots on, that kind of thing. Pretty cool. I do love the game. The next one is Forza Motorsport. And again, I love this game. I think the feeling of the cars are great. I think the noise, the emotion of your racing is really good. Graphics are good, but I think it's more of the lines of, it looks amazing when you do side-by-side -side comparisons with Forza 7 and then this Forza one. It looks so much better. It looks so much cleaner, so much neater, so much more detail. The mist effects, the smoke effects, all that kind of stuff look amazing. But when you're playing the game and you don't have the reference of the older one to look at, then you think, it doesn't look that good. It's not as sharp as it should be. It shouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? It just, your brain fills in all the defects of the older ones and you think that it looked better than what it actually did. This one has more depth, more feel, more lived in kind of environments but the racing is where it's at and I still enjoy the game I still enjoy playing the game so we'll have a few more weeks month of this game and see how we go so the first proper game this week was F1 Manager 23 now this is a game where I wish that I could on the option screen just say buy the best um person to do the research for the development of the car, buy the best marketing person to get more money into the team. I just want to be more along the lines of the um, race engineer rather. So I do the pit stops, do the pit calls, do the tyre changes, that kind of thing, do the strategies there. All the rest of it, yes, is amazing, it's really good, it's really deep and involving, but I kind of get lost in all that detail in there and it's just too much for my little brain to cope. But if you enjoy Formula 1, if you enjoy management games, it's probably one of the best management games on the Xbox or on consoles I'd say, because um, it is a really deep involving game and I think it is a really good game and I, I do enjoy it. When you're in the game, like in the racing part of the game, you can select like in-car view or the in-helmet view and it almost looks real. It looks absolutely stunning and I think it's about 35, 40 quid. So it's not full price but it's still a good game and I really recommend that. It's really good. Next game is a game that I've never even heard of but I got asked to review it so I got the code. It is Abris Build to Destroy. Now this is a mixture of like Angry Birds, it's a mixture of the, I can't think of the games where you actually shoot things in the 3D space at the castle to destroy it, it's all the pixels and particles and bricks all flying everywhere, it looked amazing. This is similar to those sort of games, but it looks futuristic, all neon, all dark, looks gorgeous. And then you have to build structures next to the building and then you have to set it so that structure you build falls onto the building and hits the detonation points and then it destroys the other building and it's very hard it's very complicated to work out what you're doing but ever so satisfying how when things explode and the particle effects are just flying all over the screen. It looks absolutely stunning. It is a, a great little game and I really, really enjoy that. I was shocked. I was amazed at how good this game was. So Abris Build to Destroy is a great game and hopefully you've seen this trailer in the background and you think, wow, that looks stunning. I thought so too. Next up, we have Jolly Put Mini Golf and Arcade. And at first I just assumed it was like a like a mini golf game. I've seen all these like for thousands and thousands of times. Like on the old Mega Drive on the Amiga, 
you know, all these old games where it's just a simple 3D uh, little mini golf thing and you just put and try and get the ball in the hole. But this is so much more. You go into the game and you have a small rectangle of space and you put your entrance, you put your food stands, your drink stands, entertainment, and then you build your own mini golf courses. Oh, I've got hiccups now. And you also get the guests, the patrons, people to come in and they play the get golf games and buy the food and stuff and leave and you get cleaners, get engineers and all that kind of stuff. So it's like a SimCity theme park management sort of game and it's great. And you can also go over the little tiny mini golf course, click on enter and then it goes into a full 3D game world where you can play that little 3D like, golf game and that part of it is a little bit janky but the overalls of this game is really good. I love this sort of game. It's not too complicated. It's just enough to get you in and keep you going. And I was really impressed with this game. I thought it was really nice, really good little game. So that's like four games in a row. That's absolutely amazing. Five games in a row, it's amazing, it's great. And then we have to follow up with another good game. And that is Starry Night. Now this one was a little bit janky in the character movement, the feeling of the game, the stilted presentation, but the art style, the graphics, everything about that is so on point. It looks like a Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh painting. It looks stunning, absolutely bloody amazing. I loved the art style of this game. It's kind of like a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, kind of beat em up, sort of scrolling beat em up -y mix. Not quite as fast and fluid as you want for a fighting game. It's a little bit more janky, but the graphics make up so much of this game and it makes you think, bloody hell, this developer who made this had an idea and he followed through and it looks bloody good. I love this sort of game. I thought it was really good. So Starry Night, buy it on Steam. I think it's cheap as chips. It's a really good little game. Then we have Mega Knockdown. Now this one, again, is very strange. Very strange. And it is the, um, a one-on-one -on -one fighting game, but it's like a turn-based fighting game. So imagine you have two characters on screen you press forward punch and then it'll go forward punch while that guy has to either do defend or attack. And if he does forward and kick because the kick's longer, it'll, it'll hit your punch. And you can do down and punch and do an uppercut and it'll affect two blocks. If you do like a forward kick, it'll affect four blocks. So the more blocks it does, the more area of effect it has. And it's... It was weird, really strange, but again, another really good idea and I really got into it, really fun game. Once you work out the aesthetics of how you play the game, it is really fun and I really, really enjoyed this game. It's a good one. Most of these are on Steam. I've, as I say, I've finally got my little cupboard sorted-ish and I can play some of these games in my cupboard. So, mega knockdown, great game. Next up, Monster Master. So this isn't Monster Masters, it's Monster Master. And it's very similar to a lot of games that come and go. It's a first person sort of shooter, but a hard sort of based game where you're a person and like zombies or monsters are attacking you wave after wave. And I guess it's like a four player or so game. I didn't connect to the internet, I just played singly. And it is just like the Call of Duty sort of like the hard modes in that, like the zombies mode, things like that. 
it looked nice, very cartoonified, very, um, yeah, it just looked very good, a Fortnite-esque sort of like the look of it. Um, it played more of a first-person shooter, more standardised. It was fast, fluid, smooth. It was looked nice, but I think that unfortunately these sort of games, unless they have a big push for marketing and everything, then you will get it, you will play it, you'll play it with a few friends, but after that, it'll slowly die off and there'll be no one playing the game. So unfortunately, I can't recommend Monster Master because of that, but the game is good. And I think that if it was a bigger developer making it or a bigger marketing push, it could have been so much more. But the game itself is good. I think it's just the player base, the fan base just isn't there for this sort of game on this game, which is a shame. And I guess we have to end with probably the worst game I played this week. It's still not a bad game, but it's just not what I would play. Do you know the Super Mario Run game where you constantly are moving forward? Imagine that, but a lot faster and a lot more Twitch based. It's called um, Step by Step. It's a 2D platform game on PC and your character is always moving. As you know, it's, it can only move one way and you can slow them down, go faster, double jump, all that kind of stuff. And if you hit a wall or hit an enemy or something, your man automatically rotates around and starts going the other way. And some of the jumps are so pixel perfect timed, or it's momentum based physics and all that kind of stuff. I guess if you're into this really hard 2D platform style game, you will get a lot out of this. Me, I just felt I'd rather have full control and play the game as I want to play it rather than just because if you make a mistake if you're jumping over six floating blocks and fall down you have to then hit the wall come all the way back jump up hit a wall turn around and then try and jump on the blocks again and it's just trial and error and it's just so hard to get right which is a shame because it seemed a good little game but I would rather play a full controllable 2D platformer with these controls because the, the controls were really good. It was just the fact that the guy, you can't really turn around and control him that well. Last thing that I want to talk about is a movie. And I actually managed to watch the Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Now, I think the reason why I wanted to watch this is because it was made by the same people who did Megan, the Android doll horror movie which was bloody good I, I really thought it was funny and, and a really good little movie and this one started watching it started getting into it i didn't realize there was such a background law for the games i've always felt that the games weren't the best i just didn't like the static screens and the that kind of thing i thought that style of game died off in the mega cd era but each to their own um, the movie itself was great. It was stupid, it was funny, it had a couple of little jump scares. You could tell it was made more for a PG-13 crowd. Didn't show a lot of the gore, didn't show a lot of the violence, but it was a good movie and I enjoyed watching it. And I will have to say, special mention, there's like, the main guy has a young little sister in the movie. And she is adorable in this. <laughs> she is absolutely adorable. The There's a little bit in the movie where she runs, and she runs right with a little hunch in her arms down uh, in front of her, and it just looks so funny. But it's a good movie. Great characters, great little set pieces. I really enjoyed it. And Five Nights at Freddy's. I might give some of the games a go once they make into the the full 3D kind of field. And please. Leave comments below if they have made a full 3D controllable Five Nights at Freddy's game that's not a VR game. Because I've seen there was a VR game that looked kind of like 3D. But you know what I mean. Leave comments. Let me know. So, thank you for watching. Um, as I say, we normally have videos every day of the week. So we have a UK Top 40s video game chat on a Monday. We have a Booster Ride video on a Tuesday. We have a Witch's Best on a Wednesday, we have a retro Thursday video, we have the podcast on a Friday, 
we have the games played this week on a Saturday, and we have the gaming and entertainment news every Sunday. So that's what we do. Me, David, One Up Gaming, episode 375 of the One Up Gaming podcast. We'll have a quick break and we'll be back to see this week's news, I guess. So back in a few. Hi, David here, One Up Gaming. Going to have a quick go at this week's news. Uh, I guess it's like new gaming news, entertainment news, that type of thing. It's from the One Up Gaming podcast, episode 375. With your host, David. Thank you. And we'll get straight into this week's first bit of news. And that, my friends, is... So the first bit of news, Echo Marvel Unveils Bloody Brutal Trailer for its first TV MA series. So that's Mature. Uh, I think Mature? For the well, everyone that's not in the UK, in the US, Jesus, man. The first trailer for Echo, the next of Disney Plus's MCU series is finally here. If you ask me, it looks like something of a return of in tone to the Marvel Netflix series. Not just because Vincent de on off Rios, Wilson Fisk Kingpin plays a prominent role. The addition to the offering, oh god, the series stars Alacqua Cox as Maya Lopez Echo, reprising her role from Hawkeye, where she de- debuted as the deaf gang leader on the hunt from Ronin, on the hunt for Ronin, Aka Clint Barton. Ah, oh. <clears throat> the trailer is somewhat unsurprisingly violent, showing. Fisk doing, doling out some brutal beatdowns, gun violence, and even one shot of a dead man with blood coming from his eyes and mouth. Ooh, sounds good. In short, it looks more like da- Daredevil than Loki or Miss Marvel. A return to a grittier, more mature feel. Significantly, it also it's also the first Marvel Studios pr- produced TV series to be rated TVMA. Per Disney's official synopsis, Echo will follow Maya as she must face her past, reconnect with her Native American roots, and embrace the meaning of family and community if she ever hopes to move forward. In another previously revealed first, Echo will also be the first MCU series to drop all of its episodes at once instead of weekly, with the entire first season hitting Disney Plus on January the 10th. Disney additionally revealed on Friday that Echo will become available on Hulu that same day, although it'll only be available on that streaming platform, April 9th. Um, That later piece of news comes just a couple of days after Disney announced that it would become Hulu, that that it would become Hulu's sole owner, buying the remaining rights from Comcast for roughly 8.5 billion. We're We're not sure if Disney will continue to make Marvel or other tentpole series available Hulu from here on out. But it's still a decent way to follow up on that announcement. I don't care. Everyone owns everyone at the minute. I just don't know what's going on. It's really weird. Um, uh, are you guys excited for Echo? I didn't have a clue it was even in the mix. I didn't even know what was happening. Um, I've not been a massive fan of the Disney sort of TV sort of series shows. I'm now in the middle of watching Loki season two. And I've got to admit it is quite fun. I do enjoy this one. So leave comments, what do you think? Next up, HBO boss Casey Bloys apologises after fake Twitter accounts were used to hit back at critics. The executive was accused of being obsessed with Twitter in a damning report that revealed HBO used fake accounts on social media to respond to negative reviews from critics. Speaking at an event in New York, as reported by Sky News, Bloys explained he was very, very passionate about his network's programming and came up with a very dumb idea to vent my frustration. He explained that six tweets were posted over a period of a year and a half in response to TV critics who had given negative reviews to the network shows. I do apologize to the people who were mentioned in the leaked emails, texts, he said. The text references were provided to Rolling Stones and a part of a wrongful termination claim against HBO from former employee Sully Timori, 
Tomori claims to have been wrongfully terminated in a separate matter, but were also set up burner Twitter accounts by HBO bosses. Alleged text messages sent between 2000 and 2001 reveals that employees, along with HBO senior vice president and drama Kathleen McCarthy, McCarthy, reportedly discussed setting up fake Twitter accounts in response to respond to negative reviews from critics. Casey is looking for a tweeter. Uh, he's mad at Alan's Sepinwall, who can. Can our secret operative please tweet at Alan's review? Alan is always predictably safe and scared in his scared in his opinions, and we have to delete this chain, right? Oh my god, I just got scared. What the hell? Uh, the Nevers. I've never even heard of the Nevers. Floyd is also up in arms about the article in New York Times chief. Who wrote that the Nevers feels like watching a show that somehow has mysteriously deleted 20% of scenes from? I don't know. I don't care. People being idiots and dicks. That's what people do. It's what people do. Um, so, uh, have you guys ever created secret accounts to tweet um, comments about stuff that you don't agree with? Or are you just idiots and just use your own accounts? Leave comments, let me know, what do you think? So, quick news now. Dune the Sisterhood has been renamed Dune Prophecy. HBO's renamed Dune the Sisterhood to Dune Prophecy. A source close to production confirms the name change after reports hit the internet yesterday. The show, expect the show is expected to launch fall 2024. Dune Prophecy is HBO's Dune prequel TV series and is set to debut on Max streaming service. Production is ongoing in Hungary despite the ongoing actor strike. Because the cast is largely made up of British actors who are members of Equity rather than SAG AFTRA uh, and won't be striking alongside their American peers. Doing Prophecy underwent creative changes back in March while also losing its director along with one of its stars. Doing Part 2, meanwhile, was pushed back several months from November. 3rd, 2023 to March 15th, 2024. Oh my God, I've got to wait another few months. Like five months, six months, whatever it is. The sequel to the 2021 film was set to be one of 2023's major theatrical releases, at least partly at issue for the fact stars Timothy Chal Chalamet um, and Zandaya. Is that just the name, Zandaya? Does she not have a surname or is that a surname? I don't know. Uh, unable to promote doing part two amid the strike. Yeah. Yeah, Dune. I love Dune. I really do. I love the movie. That remade movie that came out a couple of years ago looked absolutely stunning. I loved how the game, I loved how the movie looked. I loved how the slow burn of it all. And I think I'm so excited for the sequel, see how things go. I'm an idiot boy. I have seen the original Dune from 1980 or whatever it was. I can't remember nothing about it. I have a brain that just doesn't hold information. It can be quite fun because I can watch things that I've seen and I'm just giggling away to myself because I'm an idiot. But next up, Hulu's Futurama revival renewed for two more seasons. It's official Futurama has been renewed for two more seasons. The popular sci-fi animated series was recently reviewed, uh, revived by Hulu for its 11th season, with another on its way in 2024. Now there are going to be two more Hulu announced in a press release on Thursday. Futurama Season 11, season 11 debuted on Hulu on t July 24th, with the first 10 episodes now available to stream. Season 12 will debut sometime in 2024, Hulu said. Uh, I'm not going to go through the synopsis. I'm going to really, I'm going to watch this because I loved Futurama. Futurama. Futurama season 11 saw the return of the, the return of much of the original cast, including John DiMaggio, Billy West, Katie Segal, Ches uh, McNeil, Maurice Mc, uh, Maurice Lemash, Lauren Tom, Phil Lamar, and David Herman. Um, season 11 review only got 6 out of 10 I guess from 
IGN. But then again, when do we ever listen to what IGN says? Um, so I guess we'll go... You, do you guys like Futurama? Have you watched season 11? Should I watch season 11? Is it worth my time? Because I have a lot of work to do. I have a lot of people to do. People to do? I have a lot of things to do. Family matters. Uh, important family matters. Let me know if it's worth watching. So next up, the It prequel series, Welcome to Derry, has been likely delayed to 2025. Upcoming It prequel series, Welcome to Derry, in addition to a couple of other HBO and Max series, have likely floated over to 2025. HBO and Max chairman Casey Bloy said, as much during... So... Oh. Casey Ploy said so as much during a press event on Thursday, addressing that both Welcome to Derry and The White Lotus Season 3 will both move back a little due to the recently ended right to strike and the ongoing actor strike. White Lotus Season 3 probably would have been it would have been in play for 2024. It's 2025. Welcome to Derry had we had we had had that scheduled. But Halloween of 2024, that's now likely 2025. While that's fairly disappointing news, it doesn't mean HBO will be devoid of big shows next year. At the same event on Thursday, Bloys reaffirmed that they're targeting a summer 2024 for season two of House of the Dragon. Uh, still, it does have 2025 shaping up to be busier for HBO and Max. The Last of Us season two will likely start filming in early 2024 for the 2025 debut at the earliest. Bloy said the Euphoria season three has also been either 2025, never seen Euphoria. After months of rumours, Welcome to Derry was officially ordered for Max back in February, while Andy Muschietti, who directed both It and It Chapter 2, returning to direct multiple episodes. We don't know too many, many plot details as of yet, other than the fact that Bill Skarsgård won't be returning to play Pennywise and that it'll serve as a prequel to Muschietti's previous two films. Yeah. Are you guys excited for this? I loved it. I loved the old TV, sort of like sitcom TV movie series thing, whatever it was called. The two-parter that was really good. Uh, I really enjoyed the movie. The movies, I thought they were good. I thought the first one was probably better than the second one. But it's still a good little movie. Still a good show. Um... Are you guys excited? Let me know. Leave comments. Um, tell me why you're excited um, in this sort of movie. Because I am excited. I really am excited. I love this sort of stuff. Anyway, next up. Scott Pilgrim takes off showrunners on why the Netflix anime is more than just the greatest hits. Scott Pilgrim takes off his head into Netflix in a couple of weeks, but it's been a long road to get the Scott Pilgrim on-screen return. It's like we spent a decade hoping for it. I wouldn't have thought it would have it would even happen for that decade, um, said Scott Pilgrim creator Brian Lee Mar O'Malley in an interview with IGN, and then suddenly it happened, so here we are. It's been 13 years since Scott Pilgrim shot to stardom with the release of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, starring Michael Serra as a 20-something slacker from Toronto, Canada. The graphic novels have been around even longer still making their debut with Scott Pilgrim's Precious Little Life back in 20, 2004. Now almost 20 years after the first book, Scott is back with Netflix announcing back in March that it was developing a Scott Pilgrim anime with the entire voice cast from the live action movie returning. That includes Sarah, Brie Larson, Mary Elizabeth Weinstead, Weinstead Chris Evans and a whole lot more. And with the two decades since the first book, O'Malley has the benefit of a whole lot more life experience to Scott's tale. It's still a show about being in your 20s and being in love and making mistakes and growing up and getting in fights, but with the perspective of being made by adults. And when Brian wrote and drew those books, he was in his 20s and he just was just on that adventure of being an adult, not blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So what do you guys think of this? I loved Scott Pilgrim. I loved everything about it. I'm excited to see this. 
and I hope that it is really good. But we'll have to wait and see how this goes. Because a lot of these things, you just never know, do you? So, leave comments. Did you like Scott Pilgrim vs. The World? Did you like the original graphic novels? Uh, I think they were more like little graphic comics, really, weren't they? Um, but let me know how you think. Let me know. Um, will you be watching this series? Are you excited for this series? Or are you just, nah? Anyway, next up. Moon Knight Mirror Sequence took 10 months of VFX work. One of the most mind-bending sequences in Marvel's Moon Knight took 10 months to make, and that's just the visual effects artists. This shot probably took 10 months total to work on, said visual effects coordinator Alexandra Rebeck in a video for More Perfect Union. It was the most complicated shot in the entire show. The sequence is set early in the Moon Knight series as Stephen Grant, played by Oscar Isaac, encounters his superpowered alter ego known as Moon Knight in the bathroom of the British Museum. That's right, the show's very first episode included its most complicated shot. And while VFX artists made it look effortless on screen, it took months for VFX workers to digitally remove the cameraman who was reflected hundreds of times in the bathroom mirrors. We actually had two versions of the set, said Reback. So there was one with the mirrors where we shot his original... Uh, uh, two of well, uh, yeah, with the mirrors where we shot the original shot, and Oscar was in this this room with the cameraman, and because those are real mirrors, we were there were hundreds of cameramen reflected, so we had to spend months erasing this cameraman from all these mirrors. The result is a beautifully chaotic sequence that sees Stephen come face to face with his alter ego, Mark who saves them both from the onslaught of a jackal-like creature that was summoned by the villainous Arthur Harrow. But for visual effect workers, this was months of hard graft without overtime. When the shoot day ends for us, the second half of our day begins. So when everyone else is going off to the pub, you go back to the production office and work for four to six more hours. VFX workers are now organizing to stand up for their rights yeah, I mean, I get it. I get it. It was a great scene. It was a great look. It was a great move. Not even a move, was it? It was a great series. I thought it, the Moon Knight was really good. I really enjoyed it. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, people do need to have the full rights and the full backing of the all the stuff going on. I will never say that people shouldn't earn more. I think that, if anything, people should be earning more. Even the lowest wage should be r r rose up. So it's much more of a like, positive to get into work, to get into the working environment, to do things like that. But what do you guys think? Leave us comments. Did you like Moon Knight? I loved Moon Knight. So we're going to the next bit of news, and that is fan-made Bloodborne cart gets official release date with 12 races, boss fights, and more. Bloodborne fans finally have something to look forward to, although it might not be what they expect. Lilith Walker or PSX Bunlith, oh god, one of the developers behind PSX style Bloodborne DMAC has been testing, no, have been teasing Bloodborne Cart, another fan project set in Yarnham with graphics inspired by the original PlayStation for some time now. It finally has released it of January 31st, 2024. Originally revealed in early 2022, Bloodborne Cart started as a meme with the Bloodborne and Soulsborne fan communities. Um, I hate it when they call it Soulsborne. Just call it a Souls-like game because Dark Souls and Demon Souls, they were the first ones. I hate the, It's the same as like the um, Metroidvania. It's called it a Metro, Metroid style game because, yes, um, Castlevania uh, did actually end up copying that sort of style. That wasn't until about 1997, 1998. So it was a good 10 years after Metroid. So why should you give um, Castlevania credit in that sort of style? No, no, call it Metroid, a Metroid style game. Everyone knows what you're on about. 
Anyway, back to this. Um, and caught fire as fans at the idea of making a cat race. Uh, for as fun, soft game went as far as making art and mods on the subject. And now they're close to racing through uh, Yarnham in a go kart themselves. This announcement made in a post on X details some of what players can expect, including 12 races, 16 maps, boss fights, a campaign, a battle mode, a split screen multiplayer. It also features a gameplay trailer showing off some of the mods. Mods, I should say. I think it looks quite cool. Anyway, what do you guys think? Do you think that Sony should allow them to make this game um, and just let them release it for free as a, a just ma good marketing? That's all it needs. Good marketing. Uh, and we guess we'll see where that goes. So the uh, <clears throat> next bit of news that we have got looks as though Silent Hill Ascension microtransactions spark major backlash among fans. Silent Hill Ascension has an interactive streaming series that premiered on Halloween has Silent Hill fans up in arms after being hit with unexpected microtransactions. I didn't even know this game came out. While the series, a group based choose your own adventure is free to experience, it does include microtransactions, including the $20 founders pack. This features the season pass, access to the in-game puzzles and some in-game cosmetics, such as exclusive emotes. You can give a look at the image below. Yeah, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Uh, but I don't know. I guess if it's free to play and you don't need, if you don't need to have those in the game, uh, all these add-ons to make the game play, then I don't see the point. You can always buy stuff if you want to buy stuff. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. It's simples, really, isn't it? Simples. Um, so I guess we'll go straight into the next bit of news, and that is Sonic Dream Team announced for Apple Arcade. Sega's announced Sonic Dream Team will be coming exclusively to Apple Arcade on December 5th. In Sonic's take on the Night series, Dr. Eggman discovers an ancient device called the Reverie, Riv Reverie, Reverie, which contains the power to manifest dreams in the real world. In this, in his case, dreams of world domination, with the world turned into a twisted dream landscape. Sonic and his friends race to stop Eggman from turning his bizarre dreams into reality. Check the surprise announcement trailer from Sonic Team. There. Sonic Dream Team below. Uh, Sonic Dream Team lets you take control of Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, Amy, Rogue, and for the first time in years, Cream. We each of whom. What about the little. The. Not a squirrel. What the hell was it? It was like. I can't remember now. Um, have unique abilities with three movement types to help navigate 12 levels within the four dream worlds that have mind bending environments that include world winning and gravity changes. Among other elements, each dream world contains a boss fight that tests your skills across different environment types, uh, different movement types. The game also introduces a new character, Arim, a ram figure named after the zodiac sign Ares, with a moon tattoo on her forehead that may help Sonic and the gang achieve their goals. Sonic Dream Team is the third title to come to Apple Arcade after Sonic Racing and Sonic Dash Plus. And fifth Sega title overall after Samba Di Amigo Party to Go and Football Manager 2023. It's also the first mobile Sonic title to combine mobile and cross-platform gameplay, which means fans will not only get to play Sonic Dream Team on iPhone and iPad, but will also get to experience the game on larger screens via Mac and Apple TV. What do you guys think of the Sonic game? Are you interested in this new Sonic game? Or, I don't know. I'll play some Sonic games, but I'm just... I don't like the fact of charging 50, 60 quid for a game that maybe should be 20 quid. You know, it's just weird. What do you guys think of that? So we'll go next up. Cancelled 2004 PS2 Daredevil game unearthed. Amid speculation, Insomniac Spider-Man 2 is set for Daredevil DLC. A prototype of a cancelled PS2 game Daredevil has been has Daredevil game has emerged on the internet 
The Hidden Palace, a community dedicated to the preservation of retro video games, published a prototype of Daredevil the Man Without Fear, which was intended to launch on the PlayStation 2 but was cancelled in 2004, just before it was finished. The Hidden Palace said an anonymous developer who worked on the game sent over the prototype. An enthusiast called Solid Snake 11 then tidied up the prototype so it could be made playable. According to The Hidden Palace, Daredevil The Man Without Fear was a third person beaten action game based on the Frank Miller Marvel superhero comic of the same name. It was developed by 5000 Foot Studios for the PS2, original Xbox, and PC, published by NCAR Entertainment. The story was apparently based on the Electra Lives Again comic and kicked off with the assassination of the Kingpin. This sparks a war between rival gangs that consumes Hell's Kitchen. Daredevil can grapple at walls and use his Shadow World ability to view the heat sources from other life forms. Game plays up on YouTube. Why was it cancelled? Apparently, Sony made demands of the game that were at odds with those of Marvel itself. For example, Sony reportedly forced the addition of a grinding mechanic inspired by Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series, a big scale scope change, and the entire and the engine trouble followed. Staff left. Then Marvel apparently cancelled the project in 2004 after deciding it had stayed too, it strayed far too from the vision it had approved. 2000, 2003 did see the release of a Daredevil, Daredevil game for the Game Boy Advance. This is a separate game. To Daredevil, Man Without Fear was published, and book was all, book was published by Encore Software. That was a sad end for Daredevil video game ambitions, but could spat murder's virtual uh, version. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I do like the idea of a Daredevil, 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 Daredevil game. I played a game on the Xbox a few weeks, months ago now, where it's like a Dark Souls first person sort of game. Where you are blind, but you can use like echolocation. So if you make noise, then it vibrates this the thing and it like lights up so you can see outlines and shadows of things. And that I really, really enjoyed that. I thought it was really well well made. Bit bitty and a bit stilted with the movement and stuff. But I do think that the that Daredevil could make a fantastic game. What do you guys think of the Daredevil? Um, so leave comments, let us know, and we'll go into the next bit of news, and that is Nicolas Cage criticizes Superman cameo in The Flash. I did not do that. It's no secret that The Flash packed in plenty of superpowered cameos. However, it looks as though Nick Cage's cameo wasn't all uh, at all the same as what he filmed. When I went to the picture, it was me fighting a giant spider. I did not do that, he told. That was not what I did. The scene in question appears near the end of the flash during the cinematic uh, Ch Chernobyl battle, uh, which sees Barry Allen, played by Ezra Miller, snatch a glimpse at various worlds throughout the multiverse. Nick Cage's cameo is a glimpse of one of those worlds and a callback to the Tim Burton Superman movie that was never made but would have starred Cage as the Man of Steel. Although the cameo was very CGI in its appearance, it was nevertheless shot in, in person, with Cage appearing on set adorned in the Superman costume. And while it may have eventually differed from what he shot, Cage insisted it was not AI. I don't think it was created by AI, he said. I know Tim it, is upset about AI as I am. It was CGI, okay, so that they could de-age me and I'm fighting a spider. And it didn't do any of that, so I don't know what happened there. But I get where Tim's coming from. I know what he means. I would be very unhappy if people were taking my art and appropriating them. I get it. I mean, I am with him in that regard. AI is a nightmare to me. It's humane. You can't get more inhumane than artificial intelligence. But I don't think it was AI in the flash, he added. I just think they did something with it. And again, it's out of my control. I literally went to shoot a scene for maybe an hour in the suit, looking at the destruction of a universe and trying to convey my feelings, a loss and sadness and terror in my eyes. That's all I did. Despite the scene eventually learning on leaning on CGI, presumably to add in the giant spider, Cage did praise director Andy Machetti attention to detail when it came to the iconic suit. They did put a lot of time into building the suit. 
and I think Andy is a terrific director. He is a great guy and a great director. He loved, and I loved his two movies. However, it's still surprised to see the shot go further than he filmed. When I was supposed to do was literally just be standing in an alternate dimension, if you will, and witnessing the destruction of the universe. Uh, Cal L was being bearing witness to the end of the universe, and you can imagine with that shot short amount of time that I had what that would mean in terms of what I can convey. Yeah. I liked the Flash movie. I did think some of the CGI, it wasn't as bad as what people have made. And I think that they were purposely going for a, a Mario et, Manet, just a weird waxworky look kind of thing. I think that's what they were going for. Uh, I might be wrong, but that's what I think. So leave comments of why you hate the Flash movie. Um, tell me why I'm wrong. And, you know, yeah, just let me know. Anyway, we'll go straight into the next bit. <clears throat> Five Nights at Freddy's had Peacock's biggest five-day debut ever. Five Nights at Freddy's just offered a compelling point to the argument that films that concurrently debut on streaming platforms can still have successful box office openings. As of October 31st, the Blumhouse and Universal Pictures project has officially had the biggest five-day debut on any Peacock title, according to a press release from Universal. It didn't offer any viewership numbers, but did say it dethrones the five-day viewership totals for Halloween's End and the Super Mario Bros. movie. That's not bad. The movie is based off of a point-and-click survival game with the same name developed by Scott Cawthorn in 2014. In addition to creating the film, Cawthorn also co-wrote the feature which takes place in an abandoned theme restaurant that's home to a crew of anim animatronic oh God, creatures, let's just say. When the main guy, Josh um, Hutchinson, Mike, takes an overnight security guard position at the property, force confront the restaurant's hidden terrors and the help of local police officer Elizabeth Lane, Lale, um, and it opened up to one hundred thirty-two point seven million dollars globally. That's not bad. I mean, the the movie was good. The movie was good. It was a good little movie. I enjoyed it. Um, and then we'll go into the last bit of news that we have got this week. Still sticking with the the Five Nights at Freddy's sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> but we'll go straight into it now, and that is. Five Nights at Freddy's creator responds to the movie success. It's no secret that Five Nights at Freddy's is doing it unexpectedly, unexpectedly well. After breaking multiple box office records, the film also had the biggest five-day debut on Peacock streaming service. Now video game creator Scott Cawthorn has responded to the film's runaway success. Thanks everyone for making opening weekend such a big success. Cawthorn wrote on Reddit, it was beyond my wildest dreams. I do read the comments and critiques. So while I'm glad most people had a great time at the movies, I'm definitely paying attention and wanted you all to know that. Five Nights at Freddy's is based on... Yeah. yeah. It's... It's a good movie. Go see it. It's not... It's, it's not brilliant, but it's not a bad movie. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a fun little movie. So that is this week's UK... No, not UK Top 4, is it? That's coming next. That is this week's roundup of the gaming and entertainment news. So we'll have a quick break and we'll come back with this week's UK Top 40. So, back soon. Still David, still Wallet Gaming, still episode 375 of the Wallet Gaming Podcast. So this is where we go through this week's UK Top 40's charts for the games. Um, I will just say, go watch Five Nights at Freddy's. It's a good little movie. It's fun. Great characters, great actors. It's a fun, fun movie. So anyway, straight into this week's top 40. Number 40, Detective Pikachu Returns, and that's by Nintendo. Um, number 39, Barbie Dreamhouse Adventures from Nighthawk Interactive. Number 38 is Mortal Kombat 1 by Warner Brothers. That's dropped pretty quick. Number 37 is Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach by Maximum Games. 
Number 36 is Star Wars Jedi Survivor by Electronic Arts. 35 is Dark Souls Trilogy by Bandai Namco Entertainment. 34 is Pokemon Violet by Nintendo. 33 is Fortnite Transformers Pack published by Epic Games. 32 is WWE 2K23 by Take Two. Number 31 is 30 in 1 Game Collection Volume 1 from Just For Games. Number 30 is Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1 by Konami. Number 30, no, number 29, Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy by Activision Blizzard. 28 is Red Dead Redemption by Take Two. 27 is The Grinch Christmas Adventures by Outright Games. 26 is Sonic Superstars by Sega. 25 is Street Fighter 6 by Capcom. Why did I say Capcom? I always say Capcom. Capcom. 24 is Lego Harry Potter Collection by Warner Brothers. 23 is The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Complete Edition by Bandai Namco. 22 is Red Dead Redemption 2 by Take 2. 21 is Mario Plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle by Ubisoft. The top 20 now. Number 20 is Lego 2K Drive by Take Two. Number 19 is EA Sports WRC by Electronic Arts, made by Codemasters. Tw uh, 18 is The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, published by Nintendo. Number 17 is Resident Evil 4, published by Capcom. Number 16 is Star Ocean The Second Story R by Square Enix. 15 is WarioWare Move It, published by Nintendo. 14 is Grand Theft Auto 5, published by Take Two. 13 is EA Sports UFC 5, published by Electronic Arts. Number 12 is Mortal Kombat 11 Ultimate, published by Warner Brothers. Number 11 is The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Game of the Year Edition, published by Bandai Namco. And then we get into the UK Top 10. So number 10, Animal Crossing New Horizons, published by Nintendo. Number 9 is Minecraft, published by Nintendo. So that must be for the Switch version. Number 8 is Assassin's Creed Mirage, published by Ubisoft. Number 7 is Nintendo Switch Sports, published by Nintendo. Number 6 is Hogwarts Legacy, published by Warner Brothers. Number 5 is Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, published by Nintendo. Number 4 is brand new, and that's Robocop Rogue City, published by Nacon. Number 2, nope, number 3 is Marvel Spider-Man 2, published by Sony Entertainment. Number 2 is EA Sports FC 24, and that's published by Electronic Arts. And at number 1 is Super Mario Bros. Wonder, published by Nintendo. And that is so thank... That is so thank you. That is so much... No... That is with massive thanks to Games Press and the GFK Entertainment Software Chats, all formats. So thank you so much to them. So that, my friends, is a podcast. That's well, it's actually the UK Top 40 um, Chats. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, please stick around. We'll um, just go through the goodbyes and the thank yous. Uh, episode 375 of the One Game podcast. Um, oh, my hand's gone numb. So please go to our website, which is oneupgaming.co.uk. You can see our news, reviews, features on there. You can go to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash OUG, where you can like subscribe to our stuff, get things early. You can buy the t-shirts, the hoodies, the hats from our store either on Etsy, so just go to Etsy and search one Gaming, all one word, and buy from us there. Or you can go to our full store, which is O-U-G Tech, uh, is it dot square dot site, I think. And on there, you can even use the, is it clear pay? So you can pay in a few months, or you pay like small bit every few weeks. Great little service buy our t-shirts and jumpers and stuff from our website or UG tech so you can also get the first of our the first you can put the teeth back in we're also sponsored this week by games inspired music buy it stream it available on a load of platforms and 20 percent of each sale will go to the child's play charity 
We've also got our first 100 podcasts available at Blue Cyborg. No, not Blue Cyborg. Jesus. Available at uh, audiobooksontape.com. And that, my friends, one pound of each sale will go to the Diabetes UK. We're on Facebook, so please follow us on there. We're on YouTube, so just search for One Up Gaming. We've got over 2,000 subscribers, which isn't massive, but please help. Please um, talk to us, leave comments, like us, follow us, share us, all that good stuff. Um, you can find us on Twitch, which is twitch.tv slash OUGUK. We're on Twitter, which is at OUGOfficial. And if you want to contact us for anything, email us at contact at oneupgaming.co.uk. If you're listening to this on an iTunes or on a podcast, please um, subscribe to us, follow us, leave stars, positive reviews, all helps when going into the algorithm to try and get us more viewers and more subscribers. Other than that, thank you so much. It's been me, David, One Up Gaming, for episode 375 of the One Up Gaming podcast. So thank you so much. Goodbye.